Mike is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. He's got a master's in ancient history. Uh, the University of Wisconsin has a PhD in Hebrew Bible and Semitic studies. He has a dozen years of classroom teachings experience on the college level and another 10 in distant education. He's currently a scholar in residence at Logos Bible Software, and it's a company that produces ancient text database and other digital resources for study on the ancient world and biblical studies. Now, I didn't even jump into all your books, all the other things things you've written. So Mike, why don't you tell me more about you and just some of the books you've written? I know you got a podcast, just man, let's give us a 30,000 view of you, man. Yeah, well I I mean that those are the basics that you just read. I don't do uh green class classroom teaching anymore, it's just DE, but uh, I am a biblical scholar by training, but I'm also a normal person. <laughs> My background's pretty blue collar. I've had 35 jobs since leaving high school. I worked my way full time through 15 years of graduate school and had four kids while doing it. You know, I, my, my passion is that I really believe that the average person in the pew actually wants content. They want to be taught. They want to know scripture. And my little motto is I, I will no longer protect people from their Bible. <laughs> uh, I'm done with that. I'm serious about it because I, I mean, I, I can tell you other professors, pastors, and the places I've taught have said things to me like, you know, we need to, we, we need to remember that there are just some things about the Bible that people shouldn't know. Wow, that would make me offended immediately. Yep. Well, it, it worked for me. I mean, <laughs> You know, I, I, I reject that thinking. I think people are routinely underestimated. Leadership in the church, I think, habitually underestimates the appetite for content and the capacity to receive it. And so I want to take high scholarship, peer-reviewed scholarship, and make it translatable, decipherable to the normal person. You know, most scholars spend all their time writing for other scholars. They write for the guild uh, because of peer review and, you know, we've got to get tenure and all this sort of thing. Well, I, my what what sort of drives the bus for me is to be able to communicate that that content in just everyday language and have people really experience the thrill of of rediscovery. I, you know, you read Supernatural, which is again the entry point uh, for what I do. There's an academic version uh, of that content called the Unseen Realm, and and what I'm trying to do in both is really get people. This isn't marketing shtick. I'm serious about it. To read their Bible again for the first time. I I want the ancient Israelite, the first century Jew, living in your head so that you can read the Bible the way the original writers, you know, thought. I mean, what they wanted to communicate, I want people to catch that. There's a lot of weird stuff in Scripture. It's there for a reason. If it's weird, it's important. It plays a role in worldview and, and our thinking. And I, I have just found that people want to learn something. Uh, they want the Bible to make sense. And part of the, the obstacles, you know, one of the obstacles to doing that is that we think that our context or something modern, you know, like the Reformation or the Catholic Church or whatever denomination, that that's the context that's the filter for understanding the Bible. It's actually not. The right context for un interpreting the Bible is the context that produced the thing. And we just don't teach people to, again, think the way the original writer thought and the original reader thought. And if we did that, if we trained our senses to that, we'd get a lot more out of it. I absolutely agree. I want to ask you, we're going to bounce around a lot, I think, because you really intrigued me, to be honest, after reading your website and your book. But what made you go down this journey to pursue the depth of biblical stuff that, that you do? Well, I didn't I didn't have any spiritual upbringing. I actually, I, I was a Christian. I became a Christian in high school, and I was the only believer in my family. And it was, it was a pretty antagonistic situation. My, my parents thought I had joined a cult. <laughs> Well, they, they did. I mean, they, you know, they were, I would say they were basically irreligious. They had their own backgrounds, but, you know, we never went anywhere and it was, it was not a factor in life at all. But then when I became a believer and actually started taking it seriously, they, they were alarmed and, you know, you know, antagonistic. I mean, I, I, I had, um, you know, I had situations where we, in high school, we had a class, the, the Bible is literature. Well, guess who wasn't allowed to take their Bible to school? I mean, everybody else is probably, probably not even believers. They've all got Bibles and there I am, you know, I'm not allowed to take it, you know, not allowed to go to this or that church or this or that, you know, youth group activity. And I just believe that, you know, if I do the right thing, if I, if I honor my parents, then, 
you know, that that will matter at some point. And and it did, you know, not, not right now. I mean, they're believers now, but it took 20, 25 years for God essentially to crush them, you know, to, to love them into submission. <laughs> and they they had they admitted I mean, they have admitted to me, you know, they said things like, hey, you know, we used to do things you know, to you and say things in front of you just to see what you would do. You know, I, I walked into an argument between my parents one day. They were wondering if I was gay because I didn't go out and, you know, you know, fool around in the car with girls. And I mean, it's just bizarre. my mom yelled at me one time for not doing drugs like the normal kids. Oh, my gosh. I mean, yeah, it's just just this crazy stuff. I, I knew it then. I mean, I knew enough as as a believer to know that they're doing that because they're they're under conviction or they they want to see it if it's authentic or it, it was their way of of trying to probe that. But you know, it, it got us into some really interesting situations. So you know, that the only thing I was really good at. I mean, I played a lot of sports, but the only thing I was really really good at was academics. And so eventually, I I I, I could fill your hour with stupid stuff that I've done or thought because. Because I'll just give you this one instance. It wasn't until I was a senior in high school that I learned that pastors got paid. This is how like this is like how out of touch I was with the you know, with the religious world. And when I found that out, I thought, what? Like people will pay you to study the Bible and talk about it? Like really? And that was just, I was always interested in anything old and weird, but, and, and the Bible has lots of both of those things. But when I found that out, it's like, man, this is what I want to do. And and I loved scripture. I loved ancient languages. I, I was just good at that. That's what I wanted to do. And so I eventually wound up picking Hebrew Bible and Semitic languages because I really came to believe that that was where there were most, the most problems of interpretation, the, the things that were just sort of hardest, you know, to figure out and understand in scripture. So that's literally how I, I mean, I could have gone in, into any of the areas, but I thought this is where the most weird stuff is, the, 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 the biggest questions. And this is where I'm, I'm just going to land, you know, the, the rest, I guess, is sort of history. But again, it just, it was a very long, difficult uh, process because I didn't have any help. I didn't have any guidance. Here, here's another, again, I could fill the hour with stupid stuff. I'm taking my SATs. This will give you a clue as to how clueless I was. I'm taking my SATs in high school. My, my parents had not gone to college. I mean, I, I'm just isolated in all sorts of ways. So at the end of the SAT, they, they want you to put a number in to have your score sent where, well, nobody told me that. Like, I don't have a number for this. What do I do? Because I wasn't allowed to hand it in unless I put a number in there, one of these school codes. And so I put in the University of Kentucky. Why, you ask? <laughs> because I went to high school with Sam Bowie. And I thought, well, if I go to Kentucky, at least I'll know someone. That, that was the extent of my thought process. You know, the, my whole life has sort of been like that, where it just sort of happened. And to be honest with you, I mean, most of the major decisions I've made have really been because God has put me in a situation where I, I couldn't mess it up, you know, I mean, essentially taking <laughs> taking alternatives away. And it's like, well, here you go, you know, jump in there and, and, you know, we'll see what happens. And so there's just been a lot like that. And, you know, I've, I've never sort of lost the fascination with scripture. And, and again, because of, I, I think because of, of who I was, I, I really, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know anything. You know, it, my first exposure to the gospel was when I was nine. It was through a friend who lived next door to my grandma. I was at my grandma's a lot because my parents got divorced. And so this, the single mom, four kids, two of them had cystic fibrosis. I don't know. I, I think about it today. It's like, how did they survive? Because she didn't have an income, you know, but, but I'd go over there and they would have, you know, a, like a family Bible time. And I, my friend who was nine was like, you know, he, he just amazed me at his Bible knowledge, you know, I, and no, this is not an exaggeration. Here's what I knew. I had heard of Jesus. I had heard of Noah and I had heard of Adam and Eve. I was tapped at that point, you know, but that, that was, you know, my beginning. And then it was, you know, it was through the same family when I, when I finally was in high school that I, I came to the Lord, but my, my whole life has just been like that kind of thing. So I'd like to, to say, man, I was really wise here. I was really smart. Boy, that was an excellent decision. Okay. I, I can't claim credit for basically anything. <laughs> you know, that's just the way it is. I, I like that. One thing that you talked about was obviously going into the study of ancient language and the history of the Bible. I've always been fascinated with that because I remember getting saved 
at an early age, and I say early in my 20s, but I remember thinking, like, there's got to be so much more that we're missing. Now, I don't have, I don't know anything about Hebrew, but I just remember thinking that sitting in church, thinking out of all the people, how many times it's been rewritten, different languages, again, like you said, the person who wrote it, understanding the culture, like there's so much behind it that we don't get. Mm -hmm. So at that, at some point, what was like one of the first things I'm just curious for you that was like an aha, like, oh my gosh, we've been, we've heard this or been taught this for years, but this is really what it's saying. And I'm guessing you've had a lot of those, but do you remember like the first one or two? Yeah, boy, that that's that is a that's a really good question, and it's difficult because there are a bunch of these. Wow, something early. I think you know, just will be a bit of a generalization, but I, I remember sitting in my first Bible class and just realizing and, and and hearing that there were things there were things to think about in the sort of core fundamental ideas uh, of the faith like okay Jesus is god okay Jesus is god and man well i remember you know learning that that was that was controversial you know like and and how does that work where does the soul come from you know learning like here are the possibilities and and then not only that but but actually being taken into scripture different passages and learning you know essentially how to think through a passage and, and what what the possibilities are i mean later on I can give you give you the specific sort of watershed moment for me in graduate school. And that was, I relate this in the opening chapter of Unseen Realm. I was, you know, I had taught biblical studies for five years. I had two master's degrees. I'm in a doctoral program in Hebrew studies. In other words, I'm not a newbie, okay? And, and I'm sitting there in church, killing some time before the service. And I had a friend who was also in the Hebrew department there with me. And I don't remember what we talked about, but I will never forget the way the conversation ended. It, we, he handed me his, his Hebrew Bible and he said, you need to read Psalm 82 in Hebrew. And and so I did. And it, it, it's not difficult. The first verse is the lightning bolt. It says, Elohim itzav ba'adat el. God, Elohim, very familiar term for God, stands in the divine council. And then the next line is, Beker of Elohim Yishpot, in the midst of the gods. Elohim there a second time, but it has to be plural because it's in the midst of, can't be in the midst of one. In the midst of the gods, he passes judgment. And these plural Elohim, these gods are called sons of the Most High in verse 6. And I'm looking at that and I thought, how have I never seen that before? That sounds like a pantheon. And it, it was like, I don't remember any of the sermon, you know, <laughs> it was like yeah. I, I could not let go of that. It was so alarming. And fortunately, providentially, I had a second thought as I, as I was looking at this. I thought, I bet Jesus knew this passage. I bet Paul knew it. I bet the disciples knew it. There must be a way to understand this and still have a trinity, still have a, the uniqueness of the God of Israel, you know, the God of the Bible. There must be a way that this makes sense. And again, I had a lot of Bible under my belt, and I had never seen that. I went off and I looked at evangelical sources. There was a massive new book about the doctrine of God at a very famous professor at a famous evangelical school. He didn't even have Psalm 82 in his index. It was a 600-page book on the doctrine of God, didn't even have it in his index. I'd go to commentaries, and they'd say things like, oh, the Elohim here, they're just people. Right, right. So when we go over to Psalm 89, and you have the same setting, a divine council, a divine assembly, with the sons of God, it says they're in the sky. And the heavens. Hey, the last time I read my Bible, there isn't a bunch of Jewish guys running around, you know, floating around in the sky ruling <laughs> anything. Yeah. You know, it, it just it just didn't make sense. And I and I, I discerned really quickly that okay, this is something that is systematically avoided. And and it, it became my obsession. It, it became the topic of my dissertation. It just it, it just took me down all sorts of roads. And now that I'm on the other side, I, I can I can actually say, well, there is there is a very clear, coherent, you know, answer to this. You know, Elohim just it creeps us out. Out because we we see the letters G O and D and our brain because we're we're Westerners and we're modern you know we have all these church traditions behind us our brain just assigns a specific set of unique attributes to the letters G O and D that's why you don't put an S on it, it creeps us out well the biblical writer didn't think that way about the term Elohim. How do we know that, Mike? Because we have a PhD, and so we just bow to your knowledge. No, we know that because of how Elohim is used by the biblical writers. There's there's six different things called Elohim in the Hebrew Bible. It's not about attributes. It's just, it's just a, a word that says it's a disembodied spiritual being. That's all. It's a spirit. 
It's a spirit being. Well, there's lots of those, but there's only one God of Israel. No, there's only one Yahweh. And, and, and I had to figure that out. Something as simple as that, I couldn't find in an evangelical work. It was like nobody had ever thought of it. I had nobody to talk talk about it. And I mean, so that, again, became an orienting point in my dissertation. Then I discovered, when I discovered what I would you know, I call divine plurality. It's like, well, there's got to be a Godhead. You know, this this has to relate to the Godhead in some way. And so that took me, you know, into into the fact that early Judaism used to teach a Godhead. They referred to it as two powers in heaven, you know, two Yahweh figures, you know, the, a father and a son kind of figure. And I thought, wait a minute, you know, the Jews used to teach this until the, the, the second century. I, this is this is what prepped people in the first century for the, for the Trinity, for Jesus as God, you know, in human form. And I mean, it just took me down all sorts of roads. And I remember sitting in the library and, I, and I'm tracking on this, I'm tracking on everything I just mentioned and, and a dozen other uh, topics, you know, it, and I thought to myself, there's just something wrong with this. I'm sitting here and I and I have all this Bible under my belt and I am experiencing the thrill of rediscovery. But I know that the stuff that's just, you know, sort of putting my mind on fire here and, and really helping me understand lots of things in Scripture, I never heard any of these things in church. I've never heard. Yeah, I was going to say, I've, I, half of your book I've never heard. And, and, I, and I know people are never going to hear this. And, I, and I, I just remember sitting there thinking, you know what? I can do that. I, I can learn this stuff and I can, you know, communicate this to the person outside the guild, outside the academy. Because whether a lot of people don't realize that even believing, you know, faithful believing scholars, you know, they're, they're, they're truly saved. I mean, they, they trust Christ. But the way scholars, even believing scholars talk about the Bible is dramatically different than what you hear in church. And, and that bothered me because I thought, you know, you ought to be trying to communicate the really good stuff, the really powerful insights into all sorts of passages. You're not trying to be deliberately, intentionally trying to communicate that to just the normal person. But instead, what we've got is we've got Jesus as the cosmic life coach, you know, on Sunday mornings. We've got the same Sunday school stories, but now they have adult illustrations. Again, the whole, my, my whole thing about Sunday school should not be forever. You know, people are just stuck. And, and intelligent people, thinking people, know when they're being asked not to think. And I just thought, you know, this, it's, it's, like, it's like I was born to do this because I really cared about it. And I had the tools, I had the training to do it. And so, you know, if I'm about anything, if I can use that, it, it's trying to, you know, help people really understand scripture. Well, I have a podcast called The Naked Bible. We call it that because it's the Bible unfiltered. I'm not putting any clothes on it, okay? It, I'm not filtering it through creeds or traditions or denominations. It's just the Bible, that, it, just by itself, in its own context. And, and I'm not hostile to those things. I'm a member of a church. I'm an elder. I, I think that that's important. But at the end of the day, creeds and denominational distinctives are not scripture, and they are foreign contexts to the Bible. Okay, they are not the original context of the Bible, the context that produced the thing. And so this is what I, I have become sort of about, trying to help people look at, at the text, just take the text for what it is in its own context, and then, you know, just roll with that. You know, just just roll with that, and you and you'll be able to to see scripture in a different way, and again read it again for the first time, that sort of thing. And I, again, it's not marketing shtick. I say that stuff because that's exactly what happened to me. And again, I I wasn't a newbie. I'm in a doctoral program. Okay, but it's exactly what happened to me. I want to. Okay, so I want to go to this. At what point? Because your stuff, I'm going to say, you're, I think you're going to agree with me, but some of your teachings, some of your stuff has got to split hairs, and which makes it kind of fun, actually. What was the first time that you taught or what did you teach that really just kind of got your typical church leader or people just in a frenzy? Because... I mean, I read through your stuff. You talk about UFOs, the the Nephilim, and, and which I think I'm pronouncing wrong, and Ultimate, which I knew about those. There's so many topics that you talk about that I really think would bother people. That mm -hmm. do you remember your first one or or one that comes to your mind uh, that you taught on? Yeah. I I think in, in terms of, of people being troubled, it's probably either the Divine Council in Psalm 82 or it's – this is going to sound really weird. 
or it was the idea that that the serpent in Genesis 3 wasn't a member of the animal kingdom. And and we we already know that because of the New Testament, you know, Satan, you know, the, is an angel of light and he's the devil and the serpent, you know. But but it's amazing how how when you actually say or suggest that Eve could have been talking to a divine being that you know she knew was was not just a an animal or something like that or then there's different ways to take the hebrew term nakash it can be translated shining one for instance which is a stock description of a divine being it can be translated the one the one who dispenses divine knowledge well he's certainly doing that he's trying to lead her astray it doesn't have to even be serpent it, it, it just depends so the stuff like that even though it, it's very consistent with what we would call theological orthodoxy well, I'd never heard that in church, so there must be something wrong with it. You know, you're must you're trying to be clever here and deceive me. It's like, no, I'm just it, it's just the text. I'm as scary as the text is. There it is. So a couple of those things, but you know, you mentioned the the UFO stuff. People have to realize, your listeners have to realize, I'm into all sorts of kind of fringy pop culture things because a lot of those things like UFOs, ancient aliens and whatnot, the people trying to peddle those kind of worldviews use the Bible to do it. Oh yeah. Oh ancient aliens, you know, Ezekiel one, that was a UFO. You know, don't don't you realize that? Haven't you read your Bible? You don't even know your Bible, you know. It's all that kind of stuff. Chariots of fire, oh those are UFOs, you know, it, it, all this kind of stuff. You know, and Jesus is just one of them. You know, it, it it they just go they rape and pillage the scripture all the time, but they're not the only ones. There's a lot of things out there on the internet with revisionist views of Jesus, all sorts of what I call paleo babble, you know, just just nonsense about the ancient world and the Bible. You know, hey, did you know that that the line of Cain was fathered by the serpent, that the serpent and Eve actually, you know, had sex and then produced this other, you know, you know this is where we get the black race from. You know, it, it is a cesspool of the bazaar. And, and since I... I'm an ancient text guy. I'm an ancient history guy. And so I feel like it's my obligation to be the still small voice that's mostly ignored um, in, in the world of the internet, what I call Christian Middle Earth or just Middle Earth, you know, on YouTube and the, and the internet, that, that I should be trying to say something to get people to think better about their Bible. Uh, a lot of these people you know, I'll be honest with you. Like, I'll go and speak at UFO conferences, okay? I've been to about half a dozen of these things. And if I had a dollar, or maybe five, if I had $5 for every time either at one of those things or when I do a show like Coast to Coast AM, you know, the late night show, one of these paranormal shows, for every person that said, you know, I used to be a Christian until... And then it's until I saw ancient aliens, until I read Eric von Daniken's Chariots of the Gods, until I read Zechariah Sitchin's The Twelfth Planet, until I didn't get this question answered in church, until when I, when I asked this question, the pastor thought that I needed therapy, you know, and, and, and dismissed me. I mean, just fill in the blank. There, there are a lot of people out there who basically, because they had questions and ran into things that, that their authority figures could not answer, that they just left the faith. Wow. They just took off. That's sad. They, they, they assume, it is sad, and, and I, it infuriates me because the reasons are so stupid. But uh, at the same time, I understand it because when they ask certain questions and the pastor doesn't have an answer or just doesn't want to touch that puppy with a 10-foot pole, they are led to assume wrongly that there aren't answers, that you're hiding something. The church is hiding something from me. There's this alternative other world out here, and I'm going to go out on the, I'm going to, you know, Google's going to be my church now, you know, and he's, it's going to be my source of spiritual teaching. They just do this. And so I write fiction to try to piggyback theology on fiction. I write paranormal science fiction stuff. I'll speak at these conferences. I do, again, these new age shows. I do pagan talk shows. It's really for for people who have left the faith. I want them to I want to give them answers, and I want to say, look, I understand your reaction, and maybe you were harmed by a Christian in some way. I thought it's typically some issue of personal pain that that I've found anyway. And I, but I want you to reconsider, you know, how you're thinking about the Bible in this way. And I understand, you know, in, in some respects, if I thought this, you know, what what this Christian told you, hey, I'd be I'd be with you, you know. But but there's a better way to think about it. So uh, if you if you can, you know, reconsider. We can have a conversation, or if people are just totally outside, I like to to be into things that they find fascinating uh, enough to at least get them to the table to have a spiritual conversation. Because I'll be honest with you, you can have better and deeper spiritual discussions at a UFO conference than you can in church. In many cases. <laughs> That's funny. Because 
those people are primed. They are primed to think about big picture things. Why are we here? Right. Is there a God? If, if there's a God, what, what's he like? You know, is there more than one? Like, what's our destiny here? Why are we here? You know, they're, they're just primed to think about questions that are ultimately very theological. And, and so you can really have good discussions, you know, with people. And, and again, try to try to talk them in off the ledge a little bit, you know, so that you can, again, engage them with, with who Jesus is and, and how God looks at them and, you know, God wanting them and his family, you know, try to try to do something affirming in that way, but but not not go after them and rail against them and dismiss them and say, you know, you're just you're just a nutcase. And, you know, it, it's a mixed bag. So I'm into all sorts of this stuff. I, I do biblical scholarship, straight biblical scholarship, you know, write for peer review and all that stuff. And I have a job that lends itself to that. But I, I what really drives me is to try to, again, communicate biblical content to people uh, just for the non specialist, and then try to help people think well about Scripture. I don't like when primary texts like the Bible are abused. I don't like when people are manipulated with them. It, it just pushes my buttons, you know, when you know when I see that happening. So after I got done reading Supernatural, the one thought that came to my mind in, in the parallel of this, and maybe you can bring, I'm just curious, but it made me think of like Zeus and then like the god of water because you're talking about god so and then i start thinking about demigods and like all of that which i've never totally explored but i've seen movies and stuff and uh how does all that play because i just i don't believe in coincidence so that to me that is almost like another what is it, the Greek version of it? I, I don't know. I mean, you tell me, but I'm like, all I could think of was all these movies that I've watched that almost are parallel to what you've written, except from a non-biblical perspective. Yeah. Well, I think a good a good segue into this would be the, the pagan talk show that I've been on uh, two times. And and this guy, his faith, if you can call it that, his religion, I guess, are, are to, he worships the gods of Greece and Rome, you know, Zeus, Apollo, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so he uh, had read Supernatural and he wanted to talk. And, you know, I've been on twice and, and he really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed it, too, you know, because in his words, he, he said, you know, it's really rare for me to find somebody that speaks my language. And the thing that he didn't realize going in, but when he, he realized when he when he read the book is that this whole what I call the Deuteronomy 32 worldview about the gods, you know, and, and God forsaking the nations and putting them, assigning them to lesser gods. He goes, he goes, that that's part of Greek and Roman thinking. You know, the, and, and I said, well, you sure, Acts 17, you know, Paul alludes to that, you know, and when he's talking to the Athenians there. So we actually had common ground. And, you know, when he asked me kind of the same question, he would ask things like, so what does the God of Israel want? Oh, I'm glad you asked. You know, because we, you know, we can talk about how the Bible really lays this out. And so for your listeners, I think, you know, to be aware that these other systems are actually, in terms of worldview, very consistent with biblical thinking. The difference, the main distinction, is who is most high and why, and what does that mean? Now, I'll illustrate it this way. If you ask the average Christian, hey, why is the world so messed up? You know, why is it so bad? You know, look at all this depravity. You know, what, why? The average Christian would say, oh, that's the fall. Okay, if you ask the same question of an Israelite, or a first century Jew, that is not the answer you would get. You would get the answer that, that would say, well, there, there's actually three reasons why the world is so hopelessly messed up. Now, the fall is the first one, because that's where we have rebellion, both divine and human, enter into God's you know good world that he's created. And so that, that kickstarts the problem. The, the second problem is what happens in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And it's not so much the, the weird Nephilim stuff, because they, you know, they're, they're taken care of in biblical days, according, you know, to the Old Testament. What's worse about that is they are blamed with teaching humans all sorts of things that really a help humans destroy themselves and turn their hearts to idolatry. So that's number two. And number three is what happens at Babel. Now, we all know the story of the Tower of Babel. And we, we heard that one in church. But what you don't hear is Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9. It says, when the Most High divided up the nations, he divided them up according to the number of the sons of God. Okay, but Israel is Yahweh's portion. Jacob is his allotted inheritance. And Deuteronomy 4 says it, Deuteronomy 17, Deuteronomy 29, you, you track this idea. What, what happens is God's there, we're after the flood, 
okay, God has said, he repeated the Edenic mandate, be fruitful, multiply, and I go out there and kickstart Eden. We want to restore that. We, we all know that it, you know, it, it got ruined. We're going to restore that. So I'm giving you the same commands I gave to Adam and Eve. So what do they do? Well, they, they well, let, let's, let's go to Babylon and build a ziggurat. Well, what's a ziggurat? Ziggurat is part of a temple complex. You built a ziggurat to locate the deity, to bring the deity to you. Okay. To, so you set the terms and God's like, uh, excuse me, but I will not be tamed. Okay, I am not at your beck and call. And God decides, okay, you don't want to listen to me again. I'm going to disinherit you. I'm going to divorce you. When the Most High divided the nations, you know, he divided them up according to the number of the sons of God. I'm going to divorce myself from you, and I'm going to assign lesser divine beings, lesser Elohim, less you know, sons of God, to be your placeholders. They're going to be your caretakers now. You don't want to want to be, you know, in line with me. I'm going to turn you over to them. Now, that, that situation turns out really badly. We know that from Psalm 82. These are the sons of the Most High, the sons of God, that are getting judged and excoriated by God himself in Psalm 82. They become corrupt. They rule chaotically. They seduce the Israelites into worshiping them. This is the Old Testament explanation. So, real quick, Mike, are they angels? Are they spiritual beings like they're they're spiritual beings okay. angel okay. is actually a job description okay. Uh, okay it doesn't really it's it's a term that that doesn't tell you what a thing is it tells you what a thing does it's a gotcha. messenger okay. okay so these are spiritual beings and and the rest of the old testament but we don't know where they came from, correct? They're they're all created beings. Okay. I mean, you have Psalm 148, you got Psalm 33, you got Nehemiah 9. I mean, God gets God created all things visible and invisible. Colossians 1:16. And and they are, were originally working for him, but when they get assigned to the nations, they go astray. They become hostile, they become adversarial. They they don't rule according to to God's good justice, you know, his what the way he wants the nations run. He's they're human beings. They're still created in his image. God wants them taken care of. But but what he does when he is divorces himself from them, it's it's a judgment, it's a punishment. And then he turns around right after Babylon. What what does the biblical story say is the next event? God calls Abraham. He says, Look, watch. I'm disinheriting, I'm divorcing myself from a, a personal relationship with the rest of you, with all you nations. And you got lesser lesser, you know, placeholders now. Watch what I do. I'm going to create a new people from nothing. And they're going to be my people. Now, I'm going to make a covenant with this guy, Abraham. And it's through him, he will produce a seed, a descendant. One of his descendants will be the seed through which all of the nations will be blessed. I'm going to bring you back into relationship with me through this guy, through this family, through this race, through this this people, and through one of his seed. Of course, we know that's Jesus. But this is the situation. You know, it it goes to hell in a handbasket. I mean, it, you have you have actually three divine rebellions going on, and this is why the world is so messed up. Well, I go on the pagans, you know, talk show, and he knows all this. He's quoting me Plato. He's quoting me, you know, this or that, you know, Greek text about how the gods are, you know, assigned to different nations and nations to other gods. And I'm like, yeah, it's the same worldview. But you know what? Okay, the most high is the God of Israel. And you ask me what he wants. He wants you back. This is why Paul in the New Testament links the resurrection half a dozen times with the conquest, the subduing, the defeat of the principalities and the powers and the rulers and authorities and the thrones and dominions. They become subservient to the resurrected Christ. Okay, he what Christ did delegitimizes their authority over the nations. This is why Paul goes he goes to all these pagan places and he says, Look, yeah, I know, you know, you guys were have these gods because God disinherited back and back. We we get it, okay? But I want you to know that the time has come that in the eyes of the most high, you're not only permitted to abandon these gods, but he demands it. He wants it. You know, th this becomes the, you know, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. This is his message. And, and so the, it's a struggle now. These are real divine entities. They're real supernatural entities. You know, when, when we're at the Exodus, okay, when God says in Exodus 12, this night, Passover, this night, I will have victory over the gods of Egypt. He doesn't mean this night, I will have victory over these beings that we all know really don't exist. Wink, wink. No. Where is, where, it strips him of glory. Look, I got news for you. We think that, that the gods are just like cartoon characters, you know, or like Marvel's Avengers or something. They're, they're not real. Look, I'm better than Captain America because at least <laughs> I'm real. Okay. Right. You know, no. When, when Moses says, 
Who is like you, Yahweh, among the gods? He actually means what he says. When, when, when scripture says that Yahweh is the God of gods, it's not kidding. Okay, you can't, you, otherwise you're comparing the Lord to nothing. There is no glory in that. This is not the worldview. So they understood that. They understood that, that there was God. Like, where did that break off in history? Because I have to to tell you, you know, I've, I've even looked at that that way myself. Like, well, there is no other gods. There's just God. But that's not biblical. But that's how most people think. I would say there's lots of Elohim out there. Okay, Psalm 82, God is, you know, is judging the gods. Okay, there's lots of Elohim, lots of spirit beings out there. And Yahweh is one of them, but none of them are him. Okay, there is none like him. Either Yahweh is species unique. He is their creator. You know, what makes, what makes the God of Israel different is not the word Elohim. What makes the God of Israel different is the way he's described. He is the lone sovereign. He is the only creator. He is the only one who gets characterized by things like omniscience and omnipotence. No other Elohim, no other, you know, divine being in the Bible is ever spoken of in this way. Okay, Yahweh is is alone. You know, he, he, is, he is what we have always thought he was, you know, traditional, you know, theology here. But you have to realize this is where Paul inherits the principalities and powers. Think about what the way Paul describes. Paul uses the word demon occasionally, okay, and, and you know, two or three times, whatever it is. But look at his vocabulary. What does he call the powers of darkness? Principalities, powers, rulers, thrones, dominions, authorities. What do they all have in common? They are all words used in the Bible and outside the Bible for geographical dominion. Every one of them. Okay, so he, Paul knows what he's dealing with. Mike, before we get off track, I want to ask you this, though. So when, when God created us, he called us to have dominion. Yes. We were supposed to multiply. That dominion, those, these places were supposed to be ours. But we lost them. Right. Not only that, but there's a, why, do, why does the New Testament refer to believers as sons of God? children of God. That language has a deep Old Testament context. You know, in, initially, you know, God creates human beings. He already has a, God already has a family. Job 38, the sons of God, you know, the divine sons of God are, are there at the creation of the foundation of the world. The, he already has a family. So God decided, well, you know what, I'm going to create this place called earth and I'm going to create a different kind of being. We're gonna, he's going to be, you know, they're going to be embodied, but they're going to they're going to be like me. They're going to be imagers. Okay, they're going to be my representatives there, just like you guys are my representatives here in the spiritual world. They're going to be representatives there. And you know what? You know what? We're going to go down there and live with them. This is what Eden is. Eden is the place where heaven intersects with earth. It becomes the divine abode. Okay, the, the scholars refer to it as the cosmic mountain. This is why Eden is referred to as both a garden and a mountain. This is where gods lived, gardens and mountains in the ancient, ancient history. So God comes down here and he wants us to be members of his family along with his other family. Okay, it should be the most normal thing in the world for humans to be living with God in, in, in a supernatural sense and context, even while, you know, they're embodied. This is, you know, we, we nowadays, because we're after the fall, the New Testament talks about believers being glorified, getting new bodies, you know, so that they can, they are fit, they are made fit for a heavenly existence. This is what the original plan was, to have a blended family. And the family also happens to be a business, okay? There's stuff to do. It's not just you're members of a family, but now you, are, we are co-laborers. You are, I'm going to let you participate in what I want done on this planet. I want you to go and, and, be, and multiply. There's, it's going to take a lot of you to do this. I want you to go out and make every place in the world like this place, like Eden. You know, Eden wasn't the earth. Eden had geography. It's just a little piece of earth. I love that you're hitting on this because how many times have we heard just like escapist like theology? Mm -hmm. Like so many people think like, okay, we're the whole point of life is just so we can die and get to heaven <laughs> and right. play harps. And except that is so opposite of God's original plan in Genesis. Okay, let's go back to the sons of God thing. Okay, so God allots the sons of God to the nations, and they, they become corrupt. They become God's enemies. All right, well, well how, many, how many nations are there? What, are the, what nations are we talking about? Now, in, in the biblical world, again, this is all the geography they knew. We get a list of the nations that, that God divided at Babel. We get that in Genesis 10. There are 70 of them. All right. You know, then the, that, that number becomes significant. But eventually the goal is, OK, 
once all the Gentiles, once the other nations are brought back into the family, then Eden is going to be restored. This is why Revelation ends with the Edenic vision. But one of the neatest lines, or some of the neatest lines are in Revelation, because, you know, I don't really, I don't know how much I get into this in supernatural, but in, in divine council thinking in the Old Testament, it had three tiers. There was God, the Godhead at the top, and there's the sons of God in the middle. That's an administrative term. They get they get the most important jobs. And then at the bottom, you have the messengers, the angels. So you have God, the sons of God, and angels. These are all hierarchical job descriptions, okay? Well, isn't it fascinating that believers get the same label as the middle tier, the ones that are over the angels? In 1 Corinthians 6, when Paul is trying to convince the Corinthians to stop fighting among themselves— you know, over, you know, what, you know, wealth and resources and all this stuff. He says, look, people, don't you know that you're going to judge angels? Don't you know that you're going to rule over angels? You could translate the, the term either way. Don't you know that? Well, what is, what is Paul talking about? I'll tell you what he's talking about. He's talking about what John says in Revelation. To him that overcomes, okay, talking to believers, to him that overcomes, I will put him over the nations and he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Jesus actually quotes a messianic Psalm about you and me. To him that overcomes, I will put them over the nations. He says it twice. It's a, re and a revelation, two revelations. You know what that means? That means at the in the eschaton, when it's all said and done, we displace the sons of God who are currently over the nations. We displace them. We judge them. And we rule over the rest of God's spiritual family on this planet. We become the newly reconstituted divine council, the divine assembly. You know, the, the, the whole cloud of witnesses thing in Hebrews 11. There's, a, there's an Old Testament history to that phrase. Jesus, in, in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapters 1 and 2, he presents us, he presents believers to the Father in, quote, in the congregation, in the council. Okay, and he is not ashamed you know, when he does that in Hebrews 1 and 2, he is not ashamed to call us his siblings, his brothers and sisters, because he was made like us. And you, you read Hebrews 1 and 2 with this worldview in mind. This is our destiny. What, what, what the Bible is really about, it's a cosmic supernatural epic that really needs to, to be read supernaturally so that we understand who we are what our status is. And again, we, we need to be redeemed to reclaim this status. We need to, you know, accept Christ. We need to understand our status, who we are, and then we need to understand our destiny. You know, this Everything is going to come full circle in, in the biblical story. And in the meantime, we have this struggle over us and struggle over earth because the divine beings that are in rebellion, okay, they understand you know, after the after the cross, they understand what's going on now. And and how does this work? You know, in real life, how does this work? How do you move herds? How do you move masses of people? It's about thinking. It's about thought patterns. It's about getting them to believe certain things about themselves, about God, about Christ, about why they're even here. It's a moment by moment struggle between God using invisibly, God using his divine agents in our lives his other other human agents in our lives. Everything we do has a ripple effect that just ripples out in so many layers to other people. You know, just, just how, how providence just generates, you know, so much influence. Every little thing that we do, it actually matters. And this is what we're designed uh, to do. You know, we're, we're supposed to represent God and interact with other imagers. And ideally, that's supposed to lead us to the truth. It's supposed to lead us back home, you know, lead us to Christ. But the other side is doing the same thing, trying to subtly, invisibly, imperceptibly influence our thinking, influence what, because, because as we think, that is how we will behave. And th th this is how you move herds. This is how you, you control people and whole populations, masses of people. You have to control how they think about a small set of really, really important questions. And again, this is what's going on behind us. We, I think we really need as Christians to avoid the deeply flawed idea that Oh, I saw something spectacular happen. And, 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 you know, God can do what he wants. You know, I don't, don't have any problem with that. But I saw something spectacular. Man, God was working that at that. God was working that day. God was really present there. Hey, I got news for you. Most of the time God's present, you're never going to see it. Okay, there's this thing called the unseen hand. There's this thing called providence. God isn't just engaged. He doesn't just sort of care when something big happens. Okay, God's interest is unrelenting. 
it's moment by moment. But those who are hostile to him in the spirit world, their interest is the same. And we are just not cognizant of it. Why? Because we're modern. We're sophisticated. We're scientific. We don't think like this anymore. I got to ask you this. This just came to my mind. I mean, there's so many thoughts as you're talking. I'm thinking years of conversations. But, you know, where is so many Christians don't realize that there's I'm, I'm listening to you thinking, OK, there's a spiritual battle going on. Right. If they're fighting against us, what would you say to the to the average Christian listening or the person listening saying, well, how do I overcome that? Stop. Stop presuming that there's a spiritual battle only when you see something bizarre. You are being duped. OK, you are being trained to only take the spiritual world seriously when something strange blows up in your face, okay, or when you see or hear some strange story. That's a distraction, okay? You need to be, be, be cognizant of the spirit beings are intelligent beings. They just, they're, you know, they're the invisible part of all things visible and invisible. When they manifest, okay, that was strange, and they're, they're there, they're present, There's, something's going on there. But don't be misled into thinking that is the only activity that they engage in. Spirit beings, again, the whole thing on both sides is about how we think, how we are, we are led or misled into thinking certain thoughts that will influence certain behaviors. Now, God took the step of giving us revelation. It's called the Bible. It's called scripture. That, that, would, that would be sort of a, a step ahead. We have a reference point. We can, we can actually learn things. You know, the other side, you, know, you could say, well, they mimic that in all sorts of ways. And, and you know, I'll grant that. But it, it's a battle for the mind. It's always been a battle for the mind because as we think, as, as we believe certain things, that will influence how we behave. It'll influence real simple things like, do you really believe that this world is not your home? Do you really believe that? If you really believe that, that is going to influence how you process tragedy. It's going to influence how you process, you know, personal harm. It's going to influence how you process, you know, evil. Okay, if you really believe in your heart of hearts that this world is not my home, this is not the terminal point for me. That is going to influence the way how you handle everything and your response in a spiritual sense to all sorts of things. I think, you know, I, I, joy, let, let's take joy. Joy is not, oh, I'm giddy and happy. I'm clicking my heels and, you know, I'm, I'm a little, you know, I'm, I'm getting a little silly here. And, you know, some people have the personality. That's the way they express it. What joy really is, theological definition, is it is a theistic optimism about life. That, you know, another way of putting it, God is in control. We're, we're going to trust God with this. We're going to actually believe that God knows what's going on and God will respond to it. God will shepherd us through. And you know what? Even if it's still hard, this world is not my home. Do we really believe these things? That's good. Well, I want to, I could keep asking you questions. My typical show, we go for about 30 or 40 minutes and we're way over. So I, I try to keep it for, for listeners. I do want to ask you, how do our listeners find you? Because you there's no way we could, I mean, we've barely scratched the surface in some of the content that I've seen on your website, read your book. How do our listeners find more of you, your podcast, all that stuff? Well, the, the nerve center is dr, as in doctor, drmsh.com. So doctor and then my initials, drmsh.com. And you can pretty much find everything I do on that, like the blog and the podcast. If you want to go directly to the podcast, you can find the Naked Bible Podcast on iTunes. And of course, you know, you could just go to nakedbiblepodcast.com. And again, hopefully your listeners will remember why we call it that. We're we're just trying to give you scripture in its own context and and hoping that it will you know you'll just experience the rediscovery of scripture. There's there's just so much there that our modern blinders and, and, you know, prevent us from seeing it. And we get, we get the Bible filtered through tradition. And again, tradition is not an awful thing, but it's not scripture. It's not scripture. There's a lot more to see. Okay. So I've skipped several questions, but there's one that I never skip. And, okay. <laughs> and I've never skipped it so far. But the question is, if you could go back to the younger you, what advice would you give yourself to propel you into your future? Now, you, nothing's going to change, but you're going to basically like uh, Barty McFly or uh, Tom Hanks going back into time to tell yourself something. What would you say? And nothing is going to change? No, you can't change. Like you're still going to go through everything you're going to go through in life. 
but you're just going to, you're going to give yourself advice. Yeah, that is important because like I said earlier, all, all the really big decisions in my life were more or less made for me by providence. And again, I think in God's wisdom so that I couldn't mess it up. If nothing would change, boy, I wish I could go back, you know, maybe to when I was nine and say, believe what you're hearing here in this little home Bible study, you know, this little family devotional time about the gospel. I mean, it would have, it would have saved me seven years. I would have, it could have had maybe more of a, of a, a Christian experience as a young person. So maybe pay attention to this, believe, or, you know, <laughs> less generously, try to pay attention to life a little bit more. You know, just, you know, don't be clueless. You know, everything, the, just the lesson that I, it all happens, you know, for a purpose. If I'd have learned that a little bit earlier, I think that could have helped me in, in certain ways. Well, Mike, I want to thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're super busy and taking the time to jump on here with us, sharing your stuff. Sure.